Hello, everybody. Happy Halloween at It's a Mimic. This is our absolute favorite holiday, and we love to dig into the depths of horror from creepy crawlies to mentally disturbing acts of gory violence. If you remember, on Halloween last year, Adam, Dave, and I sat down and went through the Demon Lords. And the year before that, we covered our favorite great old ones and Elder Gods from the Cthulhu Mythos. So, here we go again, back with another round of horrifying warlock patrons. This time, we're embracing everything evil that follows the rules as maliciously as possible. And that means we're digging into what each of the rulers of the Nine Hells has to offer in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. So dust off your secret altar, grab your virgin blood inkwell, and wet the quill you plucked from the wings of a fallen angel. It's time to commune with the purest and most meticulous evils in all of existence. And sign away your very souls. It's time to find out what the deal is with the Archdevils of the Forgotten Realms. Welcome to another special episode of the It's a Mimic podcast. I'm Dan, and with me today are Adam and Kyle. And, Hello. Hello. And this episode is called Warlock Patrons, The Devils in the Details, with, but nice. with a capital D for devils. Because, like, we're capital. Okay, we're moving on. This episode is going to focus on who the nine archdevils of 5th edition are, and we're going to be giving a brief breakdown of each of them all in one episode, as well as what they might have to offer to followers. We're not going to be looking at Bell from Descent into Avernus or the statted out dukes in Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes. They're not worthy of ruling a layer of hell, so they're not worthy of any of your time. This is meant to be a useful guide for players who want to be a warlock with a diabolical patron, or for a dungeon master who's having trouble wrapping their brain about what these big baddies have to offer in way of inspiration and or plot hooks. At some point, we'll be doing a deep dive into each of these nasty bastards, but Wizards of the Coast has wisely refused to offer up a single stat block for any ruler of hell except for Zeriel herself. So that means we can focus on the who, the what, the why, and the how without getting bogged down in all those silly little details. I mean, you don't need to know about the fine print anyway, do you? Anyways, we'll try to stick to the info provided in 50, but if we do stray into other editions, we'll let you know what's not technically canon. Now, before we get started, I have a couple of questions and things to say. So guys, grab your dice, and while we do that, I'm just going to say this one little thing. As with any of these deep dives into patrons that we've seen before, or any deep dive into any lore, some of these are really weird made-up fantasy words, and the pronunciation of them is difficult. Now, thankfully, we do have a guide for a lot of what the pronunciation is going to be, but what you say at your table... Just be consistent and go with it. We might mess it up a couple times here, but you guys should be able to figure it out. So, guys, that now aside, I got to ask you guys, before we got down to researching this week, how well did you know the Archdevils in the Nine Levels of Hell? Let's roll our dice. I got a six. I got a 17. 15. All right, I'm going first. Okay, so uh, I know these guys. I love the Archdevils. Uh, the Blood War is my jam. And I can't wait to actually run a Blood War campaign at some point. Mm -hmm. um, the Descent into Avernus is not everything I want it to be. No, it, it's a bit too Baldur's Gate, a bit too little Blood War. It's also a bit too little Baldur's Gate, considering the title. Right? Yeah, that's true. Like, it just, it's kind of neither. You're wandering around a wasteland, by the way, Mad Max, right? Like, there's not really the Blood War, the intricacies, the political movements. I was running an evil campaign for about a year with... Uh, Dave and James and a couple others in there, and uh, Terry was a part of that. And they ended up in the Nine Hells. They ended up in Dees, and they were they had to travel. Actually, they ended up in um, uh, Minaros, yeah, right, and traveled to Dees, and they were working their way towards the front lines of the Blood War. I was really excited about it, and then it fizzled and died. So I'm excited to get back to it. I love this. This cool. is my jam. Cool. Huh? Uh, I honestly knew almost nothing. So it was really exciting to actually get a chance to get acquainted with some of these characters. And honestly, I I found a lot of plot hooks that I want to get into. Mm -hmm. Like, this is something I'm definitely going to use in the future. Uh -huh. Mordenkind and Stum of Oz is great for plot hooks. So is the first half of all those. Yeah. Right? I just, whenever I'm like, what do we do next? I flip it open. I just start, I may not use a hag, but the hag section will give me something. Right? Yeah, I mean, it's fairly easy to get a, some really good campaign spanning inspiration from these things. 
Um, I mean, I think we know what Adam's answer is going to be, but if you were to pick a side in the Blood War, which side are you? Well, how how familiar were you with this? Oh, with these guys. Uh, my knowledge with the Devils and Arch Devils of Five E is funny enough dwarfed by my knowledge of their real world inspirations for a lot of them, like uh, Beelzeb- uh, Beelzebul and Mephistopheles and uh, Baal and Asmodeus. Like they all have real world history to those names. So uh, yeah. Dwarfed. I've had to do some research because of this week, and I am in love with these guys. Yeah. Yeah. But devils, demons, who are you picking? Demons. Hands down. Demons. Devils. Demons. Absolutely. Look, um, if it was real, inside with the devils, give me the fine print, that's where I live. Yeah. Right? But when it comes to my fantasy shit, I want overwhelming hordes of evil to win, to take over all of reality, so my heroes can fight that shit back. Also, I think you get way better variety in demons than you do in devils. Yeah, when it comes to the stat blocks and fifth ed. So I, I, I guess that's fair. Uh, why devils? Uh, well, personally, I like existence. So I mean, that's I thought that's where we were going with it. Like who we side with in real life. But I also just like the devils more. I like that there's rules to them, and you know, there's uh, intricacies to their behaviors and their drives, right? Rather than just the mad scramble for blood and gore. Okay, I'll, I'll I'll be the third one here and just say the Yugo Ops. Um, play play in the middle against both sides. You can't tell us that. If you tell us that, then we know you're doing it, Dan, and it doesn't work. Yeah, but it's fine. It's not written down anywhere. Uh, <laughs> uh, outside of these guys, before we start breaking down these uh, Arch Devils, do you guys have a favorite devil when you DM? Oh, just like the regular devil step yeah. blocks? I mean... It does Cammy and my imp, my, yep. like who is just my favorite. Imp. Kyle might be the only person on the podcast that has not met Camion yet. You will, you will hate him. Yeah, <laughs> Camion is just um, if I if I Adam did not have to worry about social niceties and I could call you on your shit, and also I'm the DM, so I'm three steps ahead of whatever you're gonna say. Yeah, then I'm gonna and I'm going to let you know it. That's who, that's what Camion is. Okay. He's also going to judge you based on your appearance. All right. So, basically, exactly who you are as a person already. Yes. Social niceties? I don't, didn't even think you knew what those were. Um, this you have no idea how, how bad this is him back screen. Right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> God, you got a favorite devil? Uh, no, I can't say I do. Okay. Um, for me, Bone Devils. I've always loved Bone Devils. Um, Not even touching it, Dan. You sure? You don't want to touch my Bone Devil? <laughs> Adam? My bone devil, Adam. See, this is him restrained. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, so we're going to get into it now. Um, but to talk about the arch devils, we do need to lay some groundwork for who they are in the context that they exist in. And the context they exist in is the blood war. Now, war is part of Dungeons and Dragons. Battles, both grand and surgical, exist all over the material plane and in a myriad of forms. But none of them, even if added together, could surmount the eons upon eons of war engaged for the cosmos. Now you may think, Dan, we know about this. Angels versus demons and devils fighting over the souls of the humanoid masses. But I don't want to talk about the struggle between good and evil. I want to talk about the fight between law and chaos. The fight for whose evil gets to rule the cosmos. I am talking about the blood war. Now, this is an endless war. The infinite legions of the devils, immovable and strong, struck against the irresistible force of the demons. The main battlefield for this conflict is wherever the river Styx connects, really. And the demons will charter scores of Moranoloths, who are the guys who are like basically Sharon the boatman who pilots the river Styx. They'll hire scores of them to lead their demonic forces against the devils. Every millennia or so, they will crash against the first layer of the Nine Hells, which is Avernus, where the diabolical forces of Asmodeus and his generals force the slavering hordes of the Abyss back to their infinite homes. Which is what's happening right now in D&D. Like in the story of 5th edition, that, like, it's once every thousand years. That's also right now. Like, it's come about. We're on the anniversary, so it's all chaos and bloodshed right now. Yeah. Now, on the material plane, we see this play out, uh through the personification of the Blood War in minions and cultists of these fiends, with often the schemes of the mortal souls bound to their evil masters, leading to give an edge in their eternal war, either through more souls to power their infernal machines of war, or 
to find that one hidden or lost artifact, or even to add to their swelling waves of chaff on the other side. Thankfully, we have a bit of insight into the perspective of the opposing forces in the war. Firstly, the Devils, which view the Nine Hells as the front lines of the battle versus the all-consuming demonic hordes. Devils see themselves as the overseers and caretakers for all of existence. If only the rest of existence would get in line and be gracious for them holding the demons back. Thank you very much. For the demons, however, the Blood War is a game. A uh, welcome diversion with the added benefit of raging against the order that devils seek to lord over. They want the cosmos to be utterly free and in their image, and it's the devils that hold them back. So they attack the Nine Hells to keep the devils in check, while the devils fight to protect the rest of existence. And since this episode is about our devilish lords and their lands, let's get to know the Nine Hells. The lawful evil plane of the Nine Hells is, funnily enough, nine layers of hell. Weird. Quickly, in a descending order from the top and most successful to the lowest and least accessible, the Nine Hells are as follows. Avernus, Dis, Minoros, Phlegathos, Stygia, Malboge, Maladomini, Cania, and Nessus. Now, we actually did a deep dive. There is a special episode. I went into each one of these, specifically in the landscapes and who's there and exactly, so yeah. on, in another episode. So you can go find that. This isn't so much about the section. lands. It's about the guys who run the lands. Exactly. Yeah. Now, briefly, since we mentioned Avernus, and you probably recognize it as the realm you get to travel in the Baldur's Gate adventure, as we mentioned, we need to talk about the queen of all dungeons and all dragons. That's Tiamat. Now, Tiamat is the evil god of dragons, the five-headed broodmother herself, and she resides in a corner of Avernus that she has claimed for herself atop a gigantic mountain. But why Avernus? This is setting up a whole slew of plot for your devils inside of uh Dungeons and Dragons. Why would she want to make her home in the no man's land between devils and demons in their blood war? Well, rumor has it that she is trapped, nay cursed, to reside on the first layer of hell as the fallout in the war between giants and dragons that waged across the material plane eons upon eons before the first dwarf had a chin whisker. Since, like a devil, she is unable to leave Avernus on her own, she influences, like a devil, her cultists, like a, you get the point, to work with the rituals that would call her back to the material plane to restoke the fires of yet another eternal war. Dragons versus giants. They really don't like each other. So she's not a fiend. She's not a fiend. She is not dead. No. She is a god. Yes. That is immortal, trapped in, she's got like spawning pits. And she, well, yeah. We're, we're going to cover um, Bahamut, Bahamut, however you want to say it. Yeah. Um, and Tiamat. And Io and some of the other dragons. And future giants. Episodes. Oh yeah, we've got giant shit coming. We've got and giant shit coming. We have giant shits coming. Yes. Wait. Anyways, back to the Blood War, which is vital this to... Halloween the... Horror is brought to you by Taco Bell. <laughs> like, oh. uh, so, back to the Blood War, which is vital to the devilish story of 5e. Since the Abyss spawns demons in some unknown, mysterious, and incredibly prolific way, the devils have to come up with a way for their own numbers to be constantly high enough to meet the demonic forces. And since... Devils do not reproduce the same way we do. They require souls to be corrupted and surrendered in a diabolical deal to fill their ranks. But Dan, you say, we have tieflings and we've seen some of the art of these devils and fiends. There's like parts that would lend themselves to a procreation act. And well, again, I would say nay. Devils care only for gender insofar as it gets you to sign your soul away on the dotted line. That means there's no male or female devils. There is only Zul. I mean, there's only Dana. I mean, there are only devils. If a devil appears with a gender, it's either projected onto them by mortals or is a clever ruse by them. Well, they've got their souls. Now what? Devils need to fill out their legions. Yes, just like the might of Rome, the Infernal Machine is run by the million souls of the Diabolic Legion. They come in three forms, the Drag Legions, the Shield Legions, and the Sword Legions. The drag are just that, the dregs. They're the weakest, the most useless, and the most numerous of all devils. These are your Lemures and Nuparibos. In the shield legions, defense is key, where sword legions believe that the best defense is a good offense. Now, some of the names of these legions are insane and very descriptive, and I want to bring you guys into the conversation here for a second. Um, a lot of them get translated into common in very weird ways, so I'm going to say the name of a legion, and I want you guys to tell me whether it's a drag, a shield, or a sword legion, okay? Yeah. The Moment of Silence. Sword. Adam? Uh, uh, sorry, what, what were the options again? Sword, shield, or drag? Shield. Right, shield. What about the Damned Good Legion? Which is funny because they're... The devils, damned Good? Damned Good. Uh, dregs. Sword. 
It was a sword. That's one one for one. Okay, what about this one? Welcome to the Hells. Oh, that's Dregs. Oh, Dregs. It's a shield legion, oh. funny enough, because it's a defensive one. Makes sense. Um, here's one. The last in line for healing. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be Dregs. Dregs. That'll be Dregs, yeah. Um, how about this one? The momentary lapse of progress. Uh, that'll be shield. No, that is also drags. <laughs> <laughs> and my uh, one of my favorites, the hanging blade. Well, sword. sword. Yeah, that one. Yeah. That one's sword. So the names of these things are absolutely hilarious. There's a full breakdown of them in Mordekainen's, which is where we're getting a lot of this information. So take a look at it. They're friggin' hilarious. We're gonna move on. Now you'll note that as a legion, being lawful evil by nature, order is big to devils. Because of this, there's a rank-and-file structure to all of devil culture, not just the military. Sorry, I'm looking at the list now. The Drag Legions is <laughs> casualties imminent. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Pretty great. Shield Legion is front towards enemy. <laughs> <laughs> so, status, reputation, and climbing this ladder are all important to a devil, and they are pre- uh, preternaturally compelled to follow the orders of the devil ranked above them. There are 13, which of course it's 13 if you're into numerology, ranks of devil, and those ranks are often visually evident by the type of devil. From top down, we have the Lords of the Nine, which are your leaders of the layers of hell. These are your big cheeses. Next, you have your Dukes or Duchesses. Those are with the power to rule a layer, but without a layer to rule. Um, at the 11th step are your Amnizus and Pit Fiends. They're the greatest of the greater devils, and they're your generals. At level 10, you have the Ice Devils and Narzugons which are the captains and colonels of the legions. Ice devils in particular have a uh, very combat and magic focus. Ninth, we have the Araneus, which are the lieutenants of the, of the legions. At eight, we have the horn devils, which are basically your warrant officers. At seven, you have bone devils, which are your specialists and sergeants. At six, you have your chain devils, which are your master corporals. Five, you have barb devils, which are your unit command or corporals. You have, at level 4, your Bearded Devils or Maragons, which are your trained privates. At 3rd level, you have your Spine Devils, which are basically just your privates. No, Adam. I didn't say anything. <laughs> um, at 2nd level, you have your Imps, which function as messengers and spies. And at level 1, you have, as I mentioned before, your Neparibos and your Lemurs, which are basically just fodder. Now, there are a bunch of other kinds of Devils that will fill these ranks yeah. as well. Like, all the stuff that's actually published in Mordenkainen's yeah. and beyond the, the Fiendish Folio PDF and whatnot. So you can slot this shit in. You know, even if you were to pull over those crazy overlords from Eberron, you know where they're going to fit in the hierarchy. Yeah, and and if they are devils, again, they will, they're kind of preternaturally uh, driven, commanded to obey the orders of those above them on the ranking list. Now, I want to talk about the forces of hell that aren't mentioned in this ranking outside of the devils. This is uh, honestly because most of these guys sit below them. These are the cults of the devils. As I mentioned with Tiamat above, it is impossible for a fiend to leave the hells without some external assistance. So many devils deal and trade their way to power, while some choose to enter more involved agreements with a group of people to extend their power onto the material plane or in the hells. Power, riches, everything a mortal could want is up for exchange for whatever it is the devil wants, from a soul to a hidden source of power to gain an edge. Nothing is out of bounds, but it is all written down for a devil. Now, it's worth saying as well, you said that the lower devils feel this urge to follow what the higher devils say. Mm -hmm. That's because that's part of the contract, right? When they become a devil, because a soul becomes a lemur, which then becomes um, like the next higher rank, yeah. and up and up and up, right? So they actually sign on to be a devil, but they also want to progress. And that's the other thing you haven't mentioned is this is all about backstabbing. Yes. If you get the opportunity to replace the guy ahead of you or two steps ahead of you, do it. And sign up anyone else you can to help you, but leave them behind. But you have to also follow the contract. Like, there's a lot of ifs, buts, ands, yets. Like a lot that. of legalese in a devil's life. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it, but it, it's Game of Thrones season one, right? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. People are out for themselves. Yeah. Yeah. So, we are going to move on to actually break down some of these Lords of Hell now. So, guys, let's grab our dice and we're going to roll to see who gets to cover their first one. I got a five. I got a two. 
Twelve. Twelve. Okay, so Kyle, ding, ding, you ding. get some time to talk now. Tell us about who. All right, we are going to talk about the Iron Duke himself, Dees Spader, the Lord of Dees, second layer of the Nine Hells, the paranoid, secret-collecting, weapons manufacturer extraordinaire. Cool. He, <laughs> he oversees the weapon and armor supplies of the Nine Hells in their never-ending battle with the forces of the Abyss. Standing seven feet tall with dark hair, a cloven left foot, and sable skin as tough as iron, he wields a three-foot-long rod that looks like two serpents so intertwined. Do I. Uh. <laughs> Sarge, you're going to have to say Should've that again. Should have seen that one coming. <laughs> it's got it. two heads. I mean, <laughs> damn, inappropriate. It often looks at itself, doesn't it? In- inappropriate. Which is one eye between both heads. Continue. <laughs> <laughs> he wields a three-foot-long rod that looks like two serpents intertwining and has drafted for himself a suit of indestructible adamantine armor layered with spell-wrecking charms using techniques only he knows gleam throughout his long life. Other sources say that with a touch, he is capable of turning flesh to iron and then rusting it instantly, meaning that any adventurer willing to strike out against him has to be quick uh, to not see his weapon rusted. Calm, cool, and calculating, even when furious, one of his greatest strengths lies in his ability to twist others to his will, convincing them that this that his was the right way. Even though his role is primarily making weapons, he is one of the greatest purveyors of secrets in existence. He uses his legions of spies, who rival even those of Asmodeus, to scour the farthest reaches of the material plane in search of them, trying to unlock all the mysteries that the existence has to offer. To him, reality is nothing but a game, and these mysteries are his key to winning. A secret tantalizing enough will even tempt him to act against one of his fellow archdevils. If there is hidden knowledge, it will get his attention, and whether it is long-lost incantation or someone's bit of hidden misery or shame, it will entice him. Maybe it was that fanatical desire for them that led him to this his all-consuming paranoia, ever fearful that someone might be using his own tricks against him. Nowadays, he rarely, if ever, leaves his iron tower in his iron city, and gaining an audience with him is notoriously difficult, even for his own cadre. I have some more info about him because I just know. Uh, Dan, I know you said we're not going to cover the other guys that aren't actually sure. yeah. arch devils, but I know these guys pretty well. And a D Spader is paranoid for a reason. And he lives in his iron tower in the iron city. And you can't meet him because nobody can meet him because he believes that everyone is out to get them because of Titavilus, who's one of the statted up. Mm-hmm. Um, Demon. No, no, no. Devil, like the Archduke. Right? Oh, yeah. They're yeah. not quite a de- or, uh, They're not quite an Archdevil. They're just a Duke of the Nine Hells. So, um, Titavilus is the CR-16 Archdevil with pale skin, a bald head, and a live body that sports both bat wings from his back and also goat legs. He's only CR-16, so he has to set himself up to be Despater's most trusted advisor. And Despater is seemingly paranoid about enemies beyond his borders, not realizing that Titavilus is the biggest threat. The paranoia has been fostered by him, and uh, he uses his charms and political savvy to make powerful allies and remove powerful foes, so that he has now become the right-hand man, the only advisor, the Grima Wormtongue, cool, to uh, Despater. And he whispers in his ear, people now, if they want to hear any decree from him, they have to go through Titavilus, who will go out into public and speak, the other people living in Dees, the other devils and some mortals that are in there, because it is an iron city full of, um, like... Shops and bazaars and, uh, yeah. like, refineries. Yeah, it's it's the armory and, and the it's factories. An and archivist whatnot. sweat dream of a city. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, But they all sit there and they go, is Dees Spader still alive? Huh. Because we've only seen Tidavilus for years, like, for centuries. Um, but Tidavilus, like, Dees Spader is alive. But uh, Titavilus is um, is so paranoid that D Spade is going to find out what the shit that he's up to. Uh, that he is consistently coming up with uh, new machinations, and he runs Black Flag, um, oh, of course, shit all yeah, the time. Yeah. So he creates minor issues in and around the city just so that D Spade believes that he's got enemies everywhere. And Titavilus is waiting to become powerful enough, but he's just physically never going to be able to. So it's this weird standoff, and at any moment, Titavilus could fall and, yeah. and be uh, be exposed, which would just wreak havoc. Mm-hmm. I fucking love D. Spader and the weird Jafar shit going on. Cool. All right. 
So, what are the goals of this cult? Good old fashioned blackmail. Used to they used to control people and organizations. Basically, pulling a KGB. So, which cool. makes perfect sense, right? Yeah. I mean, how KG were the KGB? Gross. Yeah. <laughs> uh, bonus points are awarded if they manage to topple a government or a religious organization as well. Typical cultists. Well, according to Morgan Kynan's, D Spader's typical cultists are acolytes, bandits, bandit captains, cult fanatics, cultists. Mages, nobles, and spies. But I only really agree with the mages, nobles, and spies. Uh, the rest seem kind of shoehorned in. Yeah, I mean, you see a lot of them similar throughout all of. I, I'm not really. I, I wouldn't say that cultists and cult fanatics are shoehorned in. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like those ones were no brainers, and they were just added because. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they're in every single list. Uh, but acolytes makes a certain amount of sense too, yeah. because every cultist is going to have. I mean, acolytes are just clerics. Right, like NPC clerics. Yeah, yeah, but like he's also the weapons and armor guy, and and that more martial bend is uh, apparent with the bandits and bandit captains. And yeah, you could I could even make an argument for veterans or gladiators too, yeah. depending on. But he, he does seem to be paranoid, so I I think you're right. I'd lean into noble as well. Yeah, because I mean the the secrets are what he's really going after, right? Like that's how he gets his souls by dealing in secrets. Like if there's an archmage that's looking for a particular spell or um, a merchant is trying to figure out what the best things to sell are. Uh, they come to him and, you know, I'll give you my soul, you give me this little secret. And he's sending legions of spies everywhere, yeah. right? Like, he's got a legion of spies to rival even Asmodeus. And so, like, in my head canon, he doesn't even really seem like he would have cult followers, right? Because there's more battle-worthy... Uh, arch devils that you can go for if you are a bandit or a bandit captain rather than him he seems more like less of a cult and more of a cabal yeah i i do feel like he would have cultists on the on the material plane are going to be running around doing like his bidding just for hey find out what's going on with these guys are they plotting against me no no all right well burn them to the ground but if they are plotting infiltrate and take over i want them working for me Right, and it's that kind of, I think you're right, it's very spy master. Yeah, I, but I just, I feel like his cult would be more like the Illuminati. Yeah. Right, like power behind the throne, like whispering secrets, like the Green Worm Cup. Yeah, know? which is hilarious that it's happening to him yeah. as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They gotta learn from somewhere. Uh, signature spells, they get, uh, cultists get guidance uh, as a cantrip, identify at first level, see invisibility at second level, and clairvoyance at third level. I think it's apt, given D Spader's paranoia, that one of the spells that he gives you will also help you detect two of the other ones. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, I like that. Yeah. Um, boons provided. So they get uh, Infernal Insight, uh, which recharges after a short or long rest, uh, which basically means, as a bonus action, uh, that creature gains advantage on all ability checks and attack rolls until the end of its turn. Uh, higher level ones get Vexing Escape. Which, as a reaction, that creature, when that creature was going to take damage, it reduces the damage to zero, and that creature teleports up to 60 feet away to an unoccupied space. Cool. Yeah. Fucking nope. <laughs> <laughs> that's once per day, though, right? Yeah, that's only once per day. So, I mean, you could give it your Warlock, and I don't think it would crazily overbalance him. Uh, like, yeah, the reason that we're talking about the cults is so that when you are a Warlock, you can turn to your, to your DM, because, you know, Warlocks don't have a fuck of a ton of shit to do. Eldritch Blast, Eldritch Blast. Yeah. Oh, I got high enough level, big Eldritch Blast, right? Like, <laughs> this is what you're doing, because I, I guess I'll hex, right? Um, and so what else can you get? These are fun flavors, especially when you get into um, your Pact of the Blade. Yeah. I find a lot of this stuff is going to be useful for combat. And mixing yeah. some of the stuff when you're doing, like, a Baldur's Gate Descent into Avernus with your party and, like, having that subplot of making each one a cultist of a different arch devil or all the same because some of them also work really well if there are more of the same well that's a campaign i want to do now is just five warlocks different arch devils yeah. that have to work together sign on the dotted line suicide squad style right <laughs> yeah. cool are they all trying to backstab each other at the same time yeah that could be a lot of fun as for like what what warlock pack i would pick uh i think you could make a pretty convincing argument for tome chain or blade uh, Tome because of secrets that you're not really supposed to have. Uh, Blade because he's a weapon stealer. But if I had to pick one, it would be Chain, right? Like he's because he loves his imps. Yeah, and he's going to have a minion that works for yeah, him. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. I could see Talisman too, though. I could see Talisman as well. Yeah, but I mean, every cultist could be packed. All you have to do is pick up the Talisman and boop. Oh shit! I got an Arch Devil. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, I if I was gonna play a character with it, I'd probably uh, me try to make the party as nervous as possible. You know, like always the furtive eyed warlock, always in the corner, like consulting <laughs> with his imp. You're the guy like that that's taken the paladin off to the side afterwards and be like, "Do you think the rogue pocketed some of the change? Yeah. Like he opened the chest, but like." It divided too evenly up amongst us. He's got to have pocketed, like, he's got to have been, he's, he's taking some off the top, right? And then you go over to the rogue and be like, I think the paladin's looking at you a bit weird. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. side on, I, I think he suspects This is literally, this is literally how I get Dave and Terry to just fucking go at each other on, on episodes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so I will take over now and I'm going to start, gentlemen, with a Bible quote. Of course you are. Uh, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one or love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. That's from Matthew 6, 24. Mammon himself says the count of my coins is more reliable than any roster of mortal hearts or immortal souls. So mammon is the money devil. He is the lord of the third level of hell. He is the most supreme merchant in all the nine hells. He's also basically the Jeff Bezos of the cosmos, heads and shoulders, the richest thing to exist. He's Littlefinger. Oh, he's he's worse than that. Whereas D Spader was was Varus. Yeah. Right? With those little birds. We've got Littlefinger over here, like the master of coin. Yeah. He sits in rulership over Amazon I mean Mineros, where he oversees the trading and collecting of souls. Souls that either meet the requirements of a deal or are lawfully evil by nature come forth from the river Styx as Lemurs when they start their devilish ways. Mammon soulmongers travel the banks of the river Styx and collect, categorize, and portion them out. Any extra are sold at a profit by Mammon who hoards his wealth like a more miserly Scrooge McDuck, which I have a problem. They portrayed Scrooge McDuck as Scottish, but it's MC Duck, not MAC Duck. It's McDuck, not MacDuck. And I have issues. Anyways. You do have issues. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. How long have you been sitting on that one? Oh, so long. <laughs> Since I was like seven. Yeah. But the greatest anyways. thing about Scrooge McDuck is you know he's going to foot the bill. Hey. Oh. Anyways, so his miserly nature leaves him to completely neglect the care of his layer of hell. It is a swampy and ruined, dis- like, ruin of a layer. Anyways. Mammon only cares for his own material wealth. He sleeplessly pursues the fattening of his own coffers. He deals shrewdly and dangerously, being regarded as one of the trickiest swindlers in the devilish retinue. His deals with mortals promise immeasurable and irresistible wealth, and his deals with other devils bankroll all of their plots of the hells. Devils, without a soul to offer, will often trade him goods or favors, and Mammon will collect. A little note I found hilarious is that Mammon's devils are known by the book they all carry, which is called The Accounting and Valuation of All Things, and it helps the devilish bookies determine the monetary gain to be had by literally anything in existence. (laughs) As for his cult, they want money. Just money. Nothing else but money. Wealth. Full stop. A cult of Mammon would squirrel any money away for themselves, to use and for others to be wanting. They're typically bandits, bandit leaders, spies, cult fanatics, thugs, cultists, or nobles. Not merchants? Not merchants. That feels wrong to me. I mean, they could also be lawyers, politicians, and bankers. That feels right to me. Yeah. His signature spells, and get this, are mending. Okay. That makes Uh, sense. Yeah. Tensor's floating disc. When you got too much to carry, put it on the disc. Arcane lock, it's mine. (laughs) And Glyph of Warding, it's really mine. (laughs) Should your warlock seek to gain a boon from Mammon, they'll likely get the Grasping Hand ability. This lets your cultist of Mammon, once a rest and as a bonus action, make a sleight of hand check versus an insight check from a creature 15 feet away from it. If the check succeeds, one item that is seen and can fit in a hand is magically teleported to the open palm of the cultist. Now this doesn't work if the item is actively held or heavier than 10 pounds. I'm just going to have, like, 15 freaking cultists walk up and be like, hey, give us your clothes. And then, bam, you're nude. It doesn't ha- uh, doesn't work if they're actively held. Yeah. I'm not actively holding my shirt. It hangs on my body. I guess by that's the true, yeah. Right? yeah. I am actively holding onto this G-string, though. Weird. <laughs> Especially since no one else can see you but us. 
You can see the strain on my face. I though. don't want to see this. I'm looking at my notes, not at your face. That's typically how I do things. Anyways, should the cultists gain enough power to lead a group of people, they can be granted the promise of wealth. Again, as a bonus action and once per rest, your cultist can choose a target it could see and magically convince five allies of the cultist's choice that that target contains immeasurable wealth. Okay. This, of course, gives advantage on all attack rolls versus the target, with no time limit, no duration, and oh, also, no save from the party. You just kind of turn to your five friends and be like, that guy's really loaded, and they have to believe you. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to attack for it. No. You just, you just believe it in your soul. It's a problem when it's a party of five rogues and a bard. Yes. Right? And the bar's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, now, building a warlock that is a uh, follower of Mammon, I would say Pact of the Chain and Tome warlock seem to fit the theme of this miserly archdevil the best. And I imagine you having a little imp familiar who's floating around flipping through accounting and valuation of all things and pointing out the most valuable items at any particular moment. Hell, Go Pact of Tome and just do it yourself. Yeah. Can I spin on this? Sure. First of all, Pact of the Talisman makes sense. You were getting oh, a yes. little, like, a literal item. Yes, right? a gem. Yeah, but if you're going to have an imp familiar, right, if you're going to go that way, I wouldn't. I'd would have a Lemure. So you just have this sticky little blob falling around going, rah, rah, and picking up, like, gold it finds on the counter, and offering it. <laughs> no, put that down. <laughs> 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 That's amazing. <laughs> you just know the warlock's mind because you just hear the wet. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, because these things moan in pain all of the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, all right, stealth check. <laughs> hand over the Lumiora's mouth. <laughs> <laughs> also, because familiars keep respawning, I want one of these pathetic fuckers to, like, hey, find out what's at the bottom of the stairs. Boot. <laughs> 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 Squish! It was a pit trap. He'll be back, don't worry. <laughs> now, I did forget to mention what uh, Mammon looks like. Um, and he looks like a salamander. And not the little, like... Sk- not the actual lizard. Not the actual lizard, but like the D&D creature salamander. So the, the fire lizard. Which are like a half-fire lizard with a large snake tail. Um, he's got... But he's not fire, is he? He's not. No, he's slimy and gross. He's got gold and red skin and wings that were uh lustrous as rubies but uh he is he's got that very devil like like if joss whedon were to make a picture of mammon you now know what he looks like in your brain because he's got that uh face of a vampire from buffy oh, okay right so um and he's got the curly q mustache and he's just greasy and wet and yeah do you know why the others haven't taken him over no because i do and it's because of his right-hand man, Bale, who is a CR-19 Minotaur-looking devil that carries a nasty morning star. He is actually statted out more than Kindness. Okay. One of Mammon's dukes, he is a tactical genius who has kept Mammon from being toppled as the Lord of Minaros. He is known as the Bronze General, and he leads 66 companies of bearded devils. The only reason that he's not moved up in rank to overthrow another archdevil or Mammon himself is because he finds the politics of it all to just be confusing and annoying. He'd uh, he'd much rather be on the battlefield, where he defeats his foes and then subjugates them, transforming his adversaries into servants and allowing them to pledge their souls to him. His he has his own cult as well, mm-hmm. um, but it's relatively small because he doesn't care for all the political nonsense of running a cult. Yeah. So he just has like, oh hey, you guys are really smart and politically savvy, and you, you do my bidding for me. I don't want to have to think about it. So he has. His cult members are politically minded, weak on the battlefield, who are praying to him because he is powerful on the battlefield. Um, cool. And uh, he its actually thought of by his followers to be the king of hell. They're misguided and they get it wrong. And they think he's the king of hell. They also think that he invented the spell invisibility, but that's open for debate. So he has no use for riches, which is why he's a really good right-hand man for Mammon. Mm. Cool. So that brings us to Zeriel. I was next, so well, obviously we split it up to do the bottom three, the middle three, and the top yeah. three. So, um, Zeriel, I don't want to get into the the details of Descent into Avernus, right? Okay. Like, that's 
we're not here for spoilers. This is if you want Zeriel as a warlock patron, what do you need to know, right? So assuming that you haven't done that already because that will change uh, based on how that adventure yep. module like falls out. So anyway, Zeriel was once a powerful angel who decided she could do more good against the influx of demons from the abyss, but only if she stopped cataloging the blood war for Mount Celestia and joined forces with the Nine Hells. She tried over and over and over again to beg them. She kept saying, hey, we can go down there and destroy all the devils and half the demons and we can do this. And Mount Celestia said, yeah, but no. Mm -hmm. And so finally she's like, fuck it, I'll do it myself. So she used to look like a beautiful solar angel with perfect skin, golden wings, and a blindfold covering her eyes. But now that she's joined forces with Asmodeus and she commits herself completely to battle and warmongering, she looks like a bald angel with white skin and deep dark eyes a fiery halo, and leathery wings ruined by flame and battle. Canonically, she's lost her left hand and has a chain hanging from her stump, and at the end of the chain is the head of a war mace. Metal. Badass. In her other hand, she wields a fiery longsword. In the art, in Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes, she has cloven feet, horns, and scaly skin, but this looks like the art of just a Zeriel-inspired tiefling, and the real Zeriel is on the cover of Baldur's Gate Descent into Avernus, her left hand in that, by the way, is behind her body, but you do see a chain hanging down. When she first swapped sides, she ended up displacing Bell, that's B-E-L, um, who was a pit fiend who used to rule Avernus. Now, he acts as her advisor and cautious strategist. Um, when she gives into her fury and bloodlust, he is very calm and calculated. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, he was displaced because Asmodeus was pissed at him for being too cautious and letting the demons into Avernus getting a foothold which is why that's where the blood war is now. Okay. She's less of a queen, and she's more of a warrior general on the front lines of the blood war. And those who deal with her find that she's a furious, unforgiving collector of debts. If you want into the Nine Hells, you go through her, and she's going to claim your soul for it. Otherwise, she doesn't give a shit about you, right? And her contract is the same for everyone, or it's ironclad, and she doesn't have time for any shit. Yeah. Like, time for business, we have to go to war. Her cultists tend to be focused on gaining martial prowess. These are berserkers, soldiers, gladiators, and knights that tend to follow her. And there's actually a note in the Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes that says that hobgoblins often end up forsaking Magubliet to bask in her glory instead. That's major. Yeah. You can tell when a cult follows her if they use true strike, heroism, spiritual weapon, or crusader's mantle. The most devout followers get access to the ability called Ferocious Surge which lets them turn a successful hit into a critical once per short or long rest. Whoa. Additionally, there's a nasty ability the leaders of her cult get, which is called Infernal Tactics. This allows the follower to swap the placement of themselves and three others in the initiative order at the beginning of a battle. I mean, this is clearly Pact of the Blade, mm -hmm. right? Like, there's, oh, yeah. there's yeah, nothing yeah. else there's there. Nothing right? else here. These are powerful boons. I don't know if I would hand these out. Maybe oh. maybe tier two or tier three. Like I mean, even the signature spells, you want to give a Pact of the Blade Warlock spiritual weapon yeah. or Crusader's Mantle? Like, dear God. Yeah. Uh, these are pretty powerful, and they are clearly meant for combat. So I don't feel like it's going to imbalance a tier three party that's been playing for a while. No. I would not hand this out before level eight. Yeah. I mean, automatically critical striking, though, that's... Just once per short or long rest. Yeah. But still, when it needs to matter. Yeah. Especially if you're playing with crit tables. Fuck. Yeah. All right. Next, let's grab the dice. Let's roll. See who covers the next three. Wow. 17. You said three and I rolled a three. 12. Now. All right. So I will go first. And you um, know what? I'm going to I'm gonna cover two people at once. Of course you are. Yeah. Is um, it because of my like, two-headed snake? No. No. Okay. Uh, it, it's because these two people rule a layer of hell together. I am, yeah, very, very cute, except it's not. Uh, this is Belial and Fierna. Uh, the quote in Mordenkainen's is, A paladin, how exquisite. Sit, please, rest. Tell me about the god that would send a bright soul on so long and dark a journey. Um, Belial and Fierna are the rulers of the fiery hell, Phlegathos. They have a weird relationship being rivals, lovers, father and daughter, husband and wife, mother and son, ruler and consort, and everything in between. Now, remember what I said earlier about devils and gender? Um, they don't really have one. Well, I mean, they do, but it just it doesn't matter. And Well, they're neither 
female nor male. Like the the we, we call them by by pronouns. Yes. So that we can identify them based on what they mostly present as. Yes. Um, now these are the only two lords of hell that lay equal claim to their lair, and Asmodeus allows it. Fierna is a manipulator and brilliant seducer and conversationalist, while Belial, her co-ruler, does not entertain the same level of fancy that Fierna does, and is instead a driven and committed administrator to their layer of hell. Fierna is all charisma and charm. Belial is all structure and plan. So, you know you made a joke earlier about Zul and Dana? Yeah. It, this is Dana and Lewis from Ghostbusters. Yes. Right? Yeah. Um... These two seamless, seemingly endlessly fight against each other, uh, it almost being a waltz of mutually assured destruction. Outside of the manipulation, contingency, insurrection, and trap played against each other, if any other devil should try to take their throne, the two team up to fight against the foolish would-be insurrectionist, and the charm and intellect are focused on one singular goal, that specific devil's demise. That's like when I fight with my brother, man. I will rip the shit out of him. But don't anybody else fucking insult. That's my yeah, brother. You're allowed to do it. Nobody else is. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the land they rule is equally conflicted. While the lands are an unending plain of fire and volcano, their main city in the lair of hell is Abermoak. And it's a glorified carnival meets black market meets opium den meets orgy meets the bourgeoisie. My kind of place. Yeah. yeah. The, I'm sorry, Andrew, how much are tickets? To <laughs> the town is all about living in excess and to have every desire met and exceeded. I feel like Terry's all right there, right there. Yeah, now. he's already there. <laughs> yeah. Casinos, taverns, brothels all exist on this, the central layer of the hells, but it's also a place of justice, with Belial running the courts of the nine hells through the diabolical court that answers solely to Asmodeus. This is, understandably, where the devils get to be their most absolute devilish. Think of the code of laws that an entire plane of evil lawmakers could come up with. Marred with convolution and loopholes, trials and hearings can last eternities in this court. One added feature of the court is the proceeding over the ranking of the devils. Should a devil want to rank up, they are led to Phlegathos to be burned and literally tossed into fire. Should they be seared, they are found unworthy and are forced to take a lower rank than they walked into. If they succeed... They walk from the flames a better and higher ranked devil with all the memories and evil they had before. This is complicated for ice devils. This is very complicated <laughs> for ice devils. Now, uh, Fierna is the representative of the two uh, rulers um, to the mortals of the material plane. Belial, I would guess, being too busy to stray from his judicial planning and infighting to run a cult. Fierna, on the other hand, would love for nothing more than to manipulate her minions to her will. Uh, she seeks control, completely, over the minds and bodies of others. She's a grand puppet master. And her typical cultists are the same. They're the, the acolytes, archmages, bandit captains, cults fanatics, cultists, knights, nobles, priests, and spies. Her signature spells show the malicious nature of charms and suggestion spells at work with friends, charm person, suggestion, and hypnotic pattern at her command. Being the ambitious hedonistic devil she is, her followers follow that outset with ambition for power and love being draw the draw to her worship. Those who follow her gain the infernal loyalty trait, which grants advantage on all saving throws so long as they can see another creature within 30 feet that has the loyalty beyond death feature. What is that, you might ask? Well, should you be the leader of a band of like-minded incels, you can take, you can, as a reaction, when an ally drops below zero hit points, cause it to instead... Drop to one hit point plus your charisma modifier and half its number of hit dice. This ability is usable only once per rest. Fierna is clearly a pact of the chain. I might, I might accept talisman because dominion over a lesser life form is the mo of her ilk. I'm pretty sure the talisman is my cod piece. Though, yeah. Right? Oh yeah. It's it's definitely shaped in yeah. ways. Yeah. <clears throat> Has a dual function. <laughs> it buzzes. Nipple clamps. <laughs> <laughs> However, should you convince Belial to be your patron, I suspect that Pack of the Blade, Pack of the Blade or Tome, would fit him nicely. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I could see anything for Belial. I really could. I really like, could. Yeah, he doesn't seem honestly. He doesn't seem to give a shit. He's busy running his courts, right? Yeah. Um, but that's why there's no cult of Belial in the book. No, there isn't. No, there's just the cult of Fierna, right? And it's almost like he doesn't give a shit. We're working together anyway. Well, you mm -hmm. mentioned with the guy Bale who is with Mammon, right? Yeah. 
um, how he he has his own cult, he has all this other stuff, but he kind of couldn't be arsed to deal with a lot of the politics. Yeah, Belial is that plus some. Right? Yeah, well, if I could deal with this, but I have other shit to do. Yeah. It's like judges that don't get involved in politics, right? Yes. Well, yeah. his, his whole domain is that. And like that's his only concern is his layer of hell and yeah. justice there, and, so. and he puts the law in lawful evil, right? Like yes, that's very much so. Uh, I will be talking about Glacia. Glacia is the nine foot tall, black haired prison warden of the Dam, Asmodeus's presumed daughter, because there seems to be some discrepancy here. Basically, she showed up one day with Asmodeus, and he's like, "Hey, this is my daughter," but nobody knows exactly how she was born. That is because everyone who has been associated with her upbringing, birth or upbringing, has been completely murdered, and they've even scrubbed any sort of reference to Asmodeus's wife. Huh. Yep. Her name was Bensosia, and she and Glacia um, are, like, linked to Asmodeus, and, uh, well, I've got a story in a little bit about this, but um, one of them, clearly Glacia, killed Bensosia. Like, so... Ben Sozia is is now dead at her daughter's hand. They've scrubbed everything clean, and Asmodeus just like, here you go, you take over now. Yeah. And everyone else is like, who is this? He's like, my daughter, don't ask. <laughs> <laughs> She's presumably killed quite a few people, but nobody really knows it. Yeah, presumed daughter and ruler of Malboge, the sixth layer of Bator. That's how I pronounce it, right? Bator? I think it's Bator. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that makes more sense. Uh, similar in appearance to a succubus, but sporting a small pair of horns, leathery wings, and a forked tail, her beauty is said to be legendary, which just goes to show you that D&D players will fuck anything, given the chance. Especially with my bulge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hell. I was doing all right. Like, I was I was soldiering through. These Halloween episodes are just rife. With, you should have been here for the tentacles and the great Oh, no. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, she is said to be unpredictable and cruel with a love of telling people exactly what kind of torture they're going to get in her layer of hell. She's also a big fan of bending the rules without strictly breaking them, uh, taking advantage of the Denzians of Hell's strict adherence to tradition, using them it against them in any way she could, often stealing away souls destined for another by helping mortals escape their contracts to another archdevil in return for pledging their souls to her instead. I love that she's like, oh, you have a contract? Yeah. My contract supersedes that one. Yeah. I, well, let's find a way. See, he didn't dot this I, so <laughs> yeah. that is null and void. So you're coming with me now. Yeah, 73,000 years ago, there was a case. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Worst. No. Come to me. You go to that guy. Yeah, sure. I like Sign a contract. I like that she's like sexy lawyer type. Yeah. <laughs> she's got glasses. Like, there's the sexy librarian look there. I'm into it. Oh, yeah. I'm sure you are. <laughs> Nine yes. feet tall. Yeah. So? Death by Snoo Snoo. Uh-huh. <laughs> Worth it. And thank you for cons- uh, confirming my earlier statement that D&D players will fuck anything. Yes. <laughs> uh, master Manipulator, uh, who prefers to I'm talk- sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> you said the Master uh, Manipulator. Uh, Masturbator. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, master master Man- Manipulator. <laughs> A master manipulator. Uh, there we go. I, I did that one on purpose. Master manipulator. <laughs> now I feel like I'm not going to be able to say it uh, like no, no, you're properly not. if I try. Congratulations, you're done for the next two years. Yeah. <laughs> Son of a bitch. Uh, a master manipulator prefers to talk rather than fight. She could beguile even those she's fighting against. And if that fails, she is capable of shifting the blame onto one of her unlucky followers. Her stairs... We did it. <laughs> Look at me shake my tassels. No, then he did. Yeah. Uh, her stare is capable of knocking a victim unconscious or even killing him. Wait. Uh, according to other sources, her stare is capable of knocking a victim unconscious or even killing them. Uh, she was banished to Malboge by Alasmodius to put a check on her schemes for power. Uh, tying her to the realm and making it so the only way for her to collect souls was through helping mortals get around contracts identifying escape clauses or loopholes. Uh, she was banished to Malbolge uh, to she was banished to Malbolge by Asmodeus to put a check on her schemes for power. 
tying her to the realm, making it so that the only way for her to collect souls was through helping mortals get around contracts, identifying escape clauses or loopholes, making it so that they can get around them without actually breaking the law. Her cultist goals are basically to turn a system against itself, gaining power legally, but, you know, unethically. Uh, basically following the letter of the law while ignoring the spirit. Like malicious compliance. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Her followers are generally thieves, bandits, bandit captains, criminals, which doesn't make sense to me because she doesn't want to break the law. Mm -hmm. So why is someone dedicated to screwing with the law being followed by lawbreakers? Um, it's because I think the people that are breaking the law are looking to bend the law, but eh, I would rather not break the law. I would rather just get my way and work my way around it. Yeah. Um, if I don't have to break a rule, I'll do everything in my power to work within the bounds of the law as much as I can. But then, I mean, look, sometimes a bitch just has to die, yeah. right? Like, I think it's actually kind of cool. Uh, her story about how she got tied uh, to Melbourne is basically um, she got lashed to it. Yeah. <laughs> well, she she started creating gold, but the only gold that is accepted is if it was minted in uh, Mammon's territory. So what she did is she turned a bunch of lead into gold and then minted it there oh, and then used it to oh, buy souls. Oh, bitch, you die. <laughs> and oh, then it turned no. back to lead. Yeah. The, yeah. Technically, she was right. Uh -huh. Mam Mammon gonna... No, no, <laughs> he doesn't play like that. <laughs> and that's why she's lashed to the prison uh, level of the underworld. She's in charge, but she's also an inmate. Yeah, true. Um... She wasn't always in charge, hey? No, she wasn't. No. You guys will probably recognize an idol of Moloch if you saw it. It is one of the most famous things on, like, it was on the cover of, of multiple magazines. And, and It was on the cover of the Player's Handbook. Yeah, and one of the previous editions. AD&D. Right? Moloch used to be the person who ran uh, Malbolge. Uh, he's a large CR-21 pit fiend without wings, and he carries a lightning whip and has a nasty ability called the Breath of Despair, that causes psychic damage and fear effects. He's been banished from the Nine Hells, though. He was one of Asmodeus' favorites for eons, until a night egg started slowly convincing him that he should turn on Asmodeus. This conspiracy nearly worked, but Asmodeus became wise to it and launched a counterattack, and if Moloch hadn't plane shifted out at the last moment, he'd certainly be dead. His army of monsters and devils on the material plane have been destroyed as well because he amassed quite an army and then they all got wiped out by heroes of an old age, which I think it's a second edition um, module that was played out. Well, um, the Lords of the Underworld, Asmodeus, does not play around with, you know, usurpation. No, uh, but he uh, he essentially banished him. He was going to kill him. Moloch got away. Asmodeus says, fine, you're never coming back. Right, there we go. Dan's got a... I got my old AD&D oh, wow. player's handbook here. And uh, if you are looking at that, it's the big statue with the two guys digging the ruby gem out of the eye. That's Moloch. Yeah, and so Moloch used to um, have this big army of devils and monsters, and then it was one of the adventure modules in 2nd edition, where the heroes went, no, 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 fuck you, you're getting too powerful, and they knocked him down a peg. And since then, he's been broadcast, he has no souls, he has no money, and he has no one to help him. Mm -hmm. So he's weaseled his way back into the Nine Hells, is an imp half of the time. The other half of the time, he's his CR-21 self in the City of Brass on the Planet of Fire, hmm. where he is trying desperately to convince Yugoloths to go to war with it, or for him. And uh, they're just like, no, man, pay us. And he's like, <laughs> but fuck. So, um, yeah, he's just completely depowered and would be a really cool imp to run across in Avernus. Cool. But, like, that's you can't get higher than Avernus. He shows up as an imp there. When he's not there, he's... Look at me. Is he basically your uh, inspiration for Camion? No. Moloch was, as Modis is like, right-hand man. The two of them took over. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and then he got corrupted by the night. Yeah, and, okay. And so, like, he's not he's not fun. He's just pathetic. There was a fall from grace. Yeah. Glacia is also... Well, there's rumors that Glacia has also killed that night hag. Oh, yeah. Um, yes. I actually found some artwork of that. It's uh, uh, it's online. I, I ended up clicking through many links going down the rabbit hole, mm -hmm. and that artwork is very naked. Oh, interesting. We'll have to check that out. 
Speaking of my bulge. Mm. <laughs> All right, my turn. Uh, no, I haven't gotten to her signature spells. So her signature spells are the Friends Cantrip, Charm Person, um, at first level, Invisibility, second level, and Haste at third level. I think I would prefer to see Fear or Counterspell well, I like at the, the third level. I like the fact that she is like manipulating you at low levels, mm. and then she just like, no, fuck it, I will beat your ass into, into the ground. You gotta keep in mind, too, that these guys, they don't have stat blocks because, look, Zeriel had a stat block. Zeriel, who was on the first level of hell, yeah. the weakest, used to be a solar angel, and kind of got a little bit of a bump. So, like, these guys who oversee CR 20 and 21 pit fiends and, and um, amnesies, these guys are CR, like, 40. They're beyond the Tarask stat blocks. So her, getting, her yeah. getting haste is fucking scary. I would say that any one of these guys could wipe out a Demogorgon or a oh, yeah. Orcus. Hands down. The Demon Lords can't really hold a candle to the to the Arch Devils. But the Arch Devils are also, Zeriel and like a couple of them um, aside, don't get their hands dirty with the like nitty gritty of the... Blood. Yeah, you'll run into Bale walking around stomping on shit, but not, not many of the others. Yeah, right? yeah. Like, she's a talker. She's not really a fighter. Like, she is going to... If there's a any chance of danger, yeah. she's out. Right? Well, well, and that that's just the thing. Is most of them, you're right, most of them will send their minions, their generals, that stay back in their tent and ask for news of the war. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So for boons, for cult leaders, uh, they get Step Into Shadows, uh, which recharges after a short or long rest, and where as an action, um, this creature, along with anything it is wearing and carrying, magically becomes invisible until the end of the next turn. It's not even... Like, until you attack, it is until the end of your next turn, which is a ridiculous ability. Yeah, welcome to rogues. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going I'm going to sneak attack you now. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then cult leaders get infernal ringleader. So as an action, um, or as a reaction, when this creature is hit by an attack, it can choose an ally that can see within five feet of it and cause that ally to be hit by that attack instead, which is okay. But yeah. I mean, I think the first one is way better. Um, now, in terms of Warlock Pack, um, I would probably choose Blade, uh, and wield a glaive, you know? Yeah. Moloch's favorite weapon, actually. Just, you know, the yeah. mean, like, seven-headed whip with a bunch of spikes on it. Yeah, like, Moloch's kind of glaive is, I think, a location in Avernus. You okay. can find Moloch's glaive in Avernus. Yeah, but I, it's not an actual glaive. It's an archaeological place, isn't it? No, no, it's like the actual glaive. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I, I. That is going off memory of reading the book a year ago, but I'm pretty sure it is a location in Moloch. Straight up does not have a glaive attack. So if he had a glaive, if that's a famous thing he used to have, he doesn't have it anymore. Yeah. yeah. So my favorite of all of the arch devils is Levistus. Okay. Because Your favorite? Oh you know, yeah. Of all of them. Of all of them. Are we not including Asmodeus? No, I'm including Asmodeus. Really? Asmodeus is just super shredder. Like, there's no way to actually defeat this fucking thing. Right? Okay, yeah. Um, Asmodeus, as a big, bad, evil guy, is almost too on the nose for me. It's it's like any time that I'm watching a horror movie and it's like, oh, someone is possessed by a devil or a demon. I'm like, cool. Which one? Lucifer. Ah, oh, fuck. Really? Yeah, okay. You could have done something cool and different, but all right, here we are. So, Levistus, have you noticed that of all of these things... We have, like, the seductresses, but there's no, like, charisma-based dude for... Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no grasp, right? Well, Levistus used to be. And as a matter of fact, he is a dashing, suave-looking motherfucker in, in all the old art. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's not so much now. Um, but he used to be, after Moloch was, you know, booted out, Levistus was the right-hand man to his modis, and they took over the majority of the Nine Hells. They came up with the majority of the rules, and Levistus was absolutely one of the most trusted and most powerful. Ben Sozia was um, the queen of the Nine Hells, Asmodeus's wife. And Levistus and uh, Ben Sozia would often communicate, like the three of them were, had this weird little tryst. Um, but there was nothing romantic or sexual between Levistus and Ben Sozia. As a matter of fact, there are two myths. One is that Levistus actually asked Ben Sozia to help him overthrow Asmodeus before Asmodeus came to his full power. And he could have done it. He slayed all of the pit fiends that were her honor guard and then offered this to her. And she said no. And so he killed her. And then Asmodeus punished Levistus. That's one idea. 
The other idea is that um, he actually was romantically involved with Pensosia, um, but he was also romantically involved with Glacia. And when mm. Glacia made herself known to everyone that she was as Modius's daughter, and everyone's like, yeah, we don't give a shit. She's like, well, fine. I'm going to go be the public consort and I'm like, and I'm going to piss off my dad and I'm going to go like shack up with Levistus. And so she showed up and found Bensosia in Levistus's bed and then murdered her outright in some like Greek tragedy level cool oh, crazy Lord. shit. Right. So I like that one better because. Like an o- opposite Oedipus. Yeah, kind of. I like it better because I don't like Bensosia being this arch devil that would have like sworn herself to his motives. They all need to be backstabbing each other somehow, yeah. right? So I, I like the daughter murders the mother uh, a little bit better. But either one could be true. Doesn't matter because Levistus is now in Stygia, which is the the giant ocean that is frozen over top. There's a thick layer of ice over top of this ocean. There's some water that moves, but that water is from the River Styx. The River Styx comes in at level five and then goes out at level one. And so it goes through all of this. It goes up to level nine. Yeah. Or down to level nine and then back up to level one. But it enters through level five. And it's the only water that flows through Stygia. So everything here has been frozen. And there are all sorts of creatures in here as well that don't necessarily belong in here, like mammoths and um, like frost worms and Mm. shit like that. So people are wondering whether or not this was actually originally a layer of the hells because there were seven heavens and it's an imbalance of the nine hells. So they think that um, that they created Asmodeus' home and Levistus' prison because he is encased in a block of ice and he's impervious to damage, but he is awake and he cannot move and nothing can harm him while he's frozen in this ice. He's in this block of ice in a cavern on an iceberg that floats down the river Styx that Asmodeus controls the flow and currents of the water. So, I'm getting a lot of this from outside sources. You're not going to find any of this in fifth yeah, yeah. But I fucking love this. We do know that he's frozen in ice, and he's impervious to harm. Um, but all of the pictures that we've seen, and it doesn't say this anywhere, all of the pictures that we've seen have his fingertips sticking out of the ice, and he has this really cool ability in previous editions, which allows him to actually create amnesia if someone touches him. Oh, cool. Isn't that also part of the Of well, the River Styx, yeah. right? So, like, it's all very thematic, right? So, um, his whole deal now is that he has got to get as many souls as possible. It's all he does, and he's consumed by it, because he absolutely can never escape. It's not a, oh, you need this to do that to break the ice to free... No, he's in there. That's him. That's mm-hmm. his fate. And he knows it, but he's got to collect souls because he's part of the Nine Hells. And as Modi says, yeah, sure, you can... You can stay here and be the the head of uh of Stygia but the only souls that you're allowed to reap are the ones or people who need to escape you're going to help everyone else escape a prison while you can't so all of the cultists of Levistus are focused on survival and escape and revenge if you are imprisoned you can offer your soul to Levistus and he will teleport you away or give you the means to escape hmm that is his whole deal And so he has quite an army and a lot of followers, but no actual direction for these followers, no leadership, because he can't actually give commands. His followers are usually assassins, bandits, spies, thugs, really any creature from any station of life that may be trapped. If an an intelligent creature gets caught in a bear trap and prays to Levistus, they can get free. There's one boon, actually, for particularly crafty, forward-thinking followers, because you don't have to be stuck. If you think you might be stuck, if you know they're closing in on me, I'm going to make a pact now so that when I get um, captured, I can then get away later. And it is called the Path of Levistus. And that's when you make the deal early to allow escape at a later time. Once in your lifetime, you can teleport magically to anywhere within one mile of your location. It also heals you up to full hit points, and you can either use an action to do this, or it will kick in automatically just before the moment of death. So when you fail your third death save, Bang, there you are, a mile away, full hit points on the run again. Hmm. So how does how do people know about him if he can't communicate? Uh, I, we're, well, we're word of mouth. Yeah, 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 he's got cultists, right, that are going to that are gonna talk about, hey, you know what, if you if you say this word, yeah. if you make if you say this this prayer, you can get out of jail for free. Right. And so like that could be spread around in underworld. Literally any warlock pact could work for this guy. Yes, yeah, mm-hmm. of course. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
But he's not the only guy in Stygia. And there's someone who absolutely fucking hates him that's also there. And that's uh, Gurion. Gurion is a huge-sized man who has a large black snake uh, body from the waist down. He's massive red bat wings that spread out from his shoulder blades and a nasty stinger on the end of his tail. He's statted up in Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes. He's in constant battle with Levistus over control of Stygia, and he's actually considered to be as powerful as Zeriel on the battle on the battlefield. Cool. Mm-hmm. The difference is he's a hunter and tracker and prefers to be on the front lines so he can feel the rending flesh and hot spray of blood under his claws. He refuses to use weapons. He wants it all done with natural weapons. He does, however, have a horn that lets him summon 5d4 minotaurs to him once per day. His battle on Stygia keeps him occupied, um, and he rarely collects souls or makes any big political moves because he is so busy hunting and killing things. He got, he's got he got a horn that summons minotaurs. What does Baphomet think of that? Oh, I'm sure that must piss him off something first. Oh, yeah. Um, Gurion actually has lair actions and regional effects because he never leaves. He doesn't mm-hmm. bother to put his efforts into anything except his domain. And a lot of people think Asmodeus encourages him to do this, to fight Levistus, to keep the two of them busy. Because Levistus could get a huge army and still make a power play while encased in ice. But not if you've got to fight this great hunter mm-hmm. that's that's out there. That's just decimating all of, of his, uh, his cultists and followers. And, and because Levistus is immune to all damage. Uh... Yeah, Garion can't kill him. So he's just consistently, like, stomping out his minions everywhere he can find them. And you got to keep in mind, too, there are, like I said, other creatures, like frost giants and shit on this realm. Like, we have no idea how this, the Remorazes and shit got out here. So, like, he's just straight up hunting. This is Dave's wet dream, the frozen wasteland to run around and murder everything. <laughs> so, Gurion, however, like, he doesn't really have a cult, although there are, like, he doesn't have followers in an army in yeah. the Nine Hells. But he does have a cult of people on the uh, material plane. These are people that actually give a shit about physical prowess and dominations of others through strength, destruction, orcish shit. Right? Yeah. So um, it's normally bandits and bandit captains, berserkers, gladiators, thugs, tribal warriors, veterans, the militant martial uh, NPCs. They get shalele as a cantrip, a wrathful smite, enhance ability, and aura of vitality. So they're going to stay in the battle for a while. Now, despite the fact that Gurion has been deposed by Levistus, like, he technically was the leader for a while and then kicked out. Um, he does deal with people who seek brute strength. So any sort of, like, warlike monster, like I said, orcs, ogres, trolls, any of that kind of shit, they could pray to him and they could get um, boons. He has two, Crushing Blow, which recharges after a short or long rest. It's a bonus action where... You gain bonus to the damage roll on your next melee weapon attack as long as it hits within the next minute. The bonus equals your strength mod plus one. Cool. Yeah. So, uh, moderately useful for some. Yeah. I have no problem giving that to a barbarian. A barbarian warlock? <laughs> Fine, fuck. Sure. sure. Have this. <laughs> um, but, I mean, you could you could trigger this as a bonus action, then the next round bonus action rage, and then get the benefit of this. Cool. Yeah. Um, and then there's Indomitable Strength with recharges on a 5-6. As a reaction, when this creature takes damage, it can roll a d10, subtract the number rolled from the damage. Recharges okay. on a 5 or a 6. Yeah, but it uses your reaction. Yeah, but I'm not sure I'm going to hand that out to a player. Uh, early You're... levels, that's powerful. Later levels, that's not so powerful. 10 damage. Yeah. Every three rounds, you're mitigating 10 damage. At later levels, that's not much. You'll use that once a battle. Maybe. Mm, it's enough that I wouldn't like look I know how dice they get streaky you're gonna roll it and roll it and roll it and roll it roll it I just don't want it used against my boss monster that's gonna last 12 rounds I don't mind this against a bunch of minions sure do your thing well even still like if you're level 17 and you got this thing and your your average thing is hitting at level 17 for 3d12 sure man you can take off 1d10 of that damage yeah okay but follow me on this 3d12 on average is about 19 you're, you're half damage. Well, no, you're taking, if you're, we're going to do the average of 3d12, do the average of 1d10, so you're going to take six damage off that once every three rounds. <laughs> sure. Oh, there's a bunch of rounds that adds up. I, I mean, yeah, but I mean, they're still hitting you every round too. Like exponentially, you're going to take more damage. This doesn't 
This isn't as powerful as the other ones. I, I have no issue giving this to my player. Uh, it depends on my player. Yeah, I guess it's true. Like, also add on to the fact that, like, like the first ability, you said this guy's probably a barbarian. Okay, so now they're taking half damage from everything anyways. Yeah, so then mitigating even the middling amount of damage that you're doing now. Yeah. I, I don't want to... Look... I would put this in the hands of Megan, who will forget it. Absolutely, <laughs> I would put this in the hand of J- in the hands of James, who would one hundred percent remember that he has it. But he's playing a sorcerer. He's got twelve hit points at level seventeen anyway. Sure, yeah. Right. I'm not going to give this to Dave, who's consistently a barbarian. I will never forget this, and just be like, I get advantage on what rolls now, and he would be like, Can I blow? Bardic inspiration under this reroll five six. Like he would be sitting there trying to fuck this. Ten ways from Sunday to trigger this every round. And he's already going to be a pain in the ass to hit. Yeah. Like, depending on my player, I'm not really going to hand this out. Anyways, what, what order do we do that in? Who? What order was four, six, five? Yeah. What do we do? We do two, three, one, four, six, five. All right, let's roll dice again and see if we can go seven, eight, nine. I got a three. Eleven. Ah, ten. We didn't go seven, eight, nine. No. Well, I got a perfect record, and that's all that matters, so. Yeah. <laughs> is, is it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to me, uh, Beelzebul, also called the Lord of Flies or the Lord of Lies, was... or the Lord of Thighs, <laughs> or the Lord of Fries. I like mine better. <gasps> hey, thick thighs save lives. Was once an archon of the Seven Heavens. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kyle, for taking us away from that. Rescue Lord, us, please. Who's ever <laughs> editing this? Don't remove that pause. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But his thirst for power and his selfish acts, in the name of perfection. Caused him to be cast out, uh, and his beautiful form cursed with the multifaceted eyes of a fly. He was taken in by Asmodeus and quickly rose to power, ruling both Melboge and Melodomini. However, after he attempted to usurp the throne from Asmodeus, he was cursed into the body of a horrific 25 foot long slug, secreting both mucus and filth, and surrounded by a mass of flies everywhere he went. Cursed to live in this form for one year for every lie he told the devil, stretching back to his admittance to Beator, um, so thousands of years. So every lie he had ever told going and, back. And, and that's that's like every lie that a, the king of hell yeah. has the, determined is a lie. The like, lord of lies. Remember that time you farted in my company and you said it was the dog? You motherfucker, one more year. <laughs> My, my question is, how much slurm does he produce? Probably a lot of slurm. Probably a lot of slurm. Yeah. But this is not just any slurm. This is like... High caffeinated s- slurm. Yes. <laughs> Secret recipe slurm. Original slurm. Gross. Uh, <laughs> straight from the source. Yeah. Organic slurm. <laughs> <laughs> Curse to live in this form for every lie, or for one year for every lie, he told a devil stretching back to his immense to Beator, only recently regaining his original form. He now lives under the threat uh, that the curse will resume should he lie again. Now he rolls, rules only Malo Domini, Beator's seventh level and bureaucracy center of all the hell's documents. Oh, I'm sorry. The, the guy who's in charge of the bureaucracy of hell can't lie? Or he turns into a 25 foot slug, 25 foot tall slug fly monster. Yeah. He's, With he's tiny actually motivated. Prehensile arms that are kind of like tails. <laughs> I, I love the idea that he's just. How much longer do I have to stand in line? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I can't promise anything. A while. <laughs> This is where all the documents, all the contracts that have ever been signed, any sort of scientific research, anything like that, it all goes to him. He actually was cursed with this 25-foot slug form after he started messing with those documents uh, and almost took over hell. But uh, he was found out by Asmodeus, and here we are now. See, to me, this is the hellish, uh, hellest, hellest? This is the most hellish of all of the hells that we've given. Where it's just like, all right, so you have to go and uh, go go file all yeah. of that. Oh, you got to do a schedule? Here, one second. Here's the hell level of spreadsheets. <laughs> like, this dude is just sitting there looking at endless expel- Excel spreadsheets. Just like, Dan, yeah. I can only get so erect, you need to stop. <laughs> An arrogant perfectionist, his once beautiful layer of hell is said to be charred, wasted hellscape. 
from his constant rebuilding in search of the perfect city. He viewed his time as a slug as a humiliating experience, um, becoming a cruel taskmaster to those who served under him. He preys on the desperate who have lost their glory, reputation, or riches and wish for a chance at redemption. A conniving and ruthless liar, he often hides the true cost of a uh, deal deep within the contracts uh, he has his unsuspecting victims sign. His cultist goals are to seek redemption or a return to power and exact revenge on those they feel have taken it from them. Their ranks consisting of anyone that falls under that category. I can see a good questline being like a tyrant who was ousted uh, from power and is looking to take it back by poisoning the people of the town against the new ruler. Yeah, this is another yeah. Grima worm tongue level of yeah. thing. Yeah, the, well, I mean, there's a lot of duplicity, but again, you can lie, but I can't. Yeah. Well, he can lie to humans, like mortals. He can't just can't lie to another devil. Oh, okay. So he's oh, not sure. bound by the same curse when he is dealing with new souls. It's like getting married, right? Like, you can lie to the kids, but don't lie to your wife. Yeah. Uh, sure, you can have ice cream. Yes, yes, baby, you can have ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair. Okay, yeah, you're, you're right. Um... His signature spells consist of minor illusion as a cantrip, disguised self at first level, phantasmal force at second level, major image at third level, which I think are pretty on brand, right? Like They're all illusion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Lord of Lies, there it is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, his boon or his boon is uh, Path of Beelzebul. Uh, as a bonus action on its turn, uh, the creature can choose one ally it can see within 30 feet of it. Until the start of uh, the original creature's next turn, it gains advantage on all ability checks and attack rolls, while the chosen ally suffers disadvantage on all attack uh, cool. ability checks and I attack rolls. Chosen ally, form. too. It's like, hey, bud. Yeah, good fuck so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, you could give that to a player because it's not, I think it's going to balance itself out in the end, but it's going to piss off your party. Yeah. Oh, you want to you have par uh, party politics in a game? Yeah. Like, give this to your one character who's all like, hey, uh, you you didn't bring the soda like you said you were going to, so fuck you this session. Yeah. <laughs> As for Warlock Pack, I think you mean Tome or no Talisman, that's what I was gonna say. Like Pack of the Talisman. I could see either Pack of the Chain even as well, just because you're um you've you've entered into a deal with a familiar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? I like I could see any one of those being perfectly fine. Not Pack of the Blade. No, they don't no. cut through red tape. No. Alright, so I've got Big Papa Asmo. Okay. Um, Asmodeus. No. Not Amadeus. No. Amadeus. No. Amadeus. No. Oh, Amadeus. Oh, Amadeus? <laughs> no. So uh, this is Asmodeus. He is the ruler of the Nine Hells, and he is considered to be a deity by some people. However, that tends to be in flux, and it might be depending who you ask. Um, if you're in the Nine Hells, he's a deity. Yeah. So, um, he looks and acts like the Christian devil, but for the most part, I mean, he's got paler purple skin, and large, sweeping, forward-facing horns from above, from above his temples. And he wears long, flowing robes. He looks almost like a like a diabolical judge. Cool. In the way that he dresses. Um, so, he was always super powerful. He was always this level of, like, ridiculous um, strength. He's a strategist. He's utterly, totally brilliant. But he wasn't quite god-level power. For the longest time. He's one of the smartest people in D&D, &D, right? If one you of the need, smartest entities. If you need a strategist, he's top three, probably top one, mm -hmm. right? Um, you might be able to make an argument for a god of intellect, uh, or a god of knowledge might, could in theory be smarter, but he's not just smart, he's cunning, he's wise, yeah. and he's powerful. He does not fail at shit. He is leading... The most backstabbing group of people. And he likes it that way. And yeah. he encourages them to do that. Too, yeah. right? And to stay one step ahead of all of them, you've got to be yeah. a genius. He's the Caesar of hell. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so there is the blood war. The blood war exists because the abyss started spewing out demons, right? Just farting them into existence and send them out to raise hell. Get it? Yeah. R-A-Z-E. Raise yeah, hell. Yeah, to, yeah. To, that's what I see what I did. Anyways. So they sent them out to do that, and he said, you know what, all right, I'm going to stop them, I'm going to get a bunch of devils, and then he's like, I don't have enough, so I'm just going to start fucking with mortals, and we're going to get some more souls down here. At which point, Mount Celestia was like, okay, now hold on a fucking second, you're doing what now? And the two of them got in this big 
like argument and Asmodeus is like, fine, fine, bitches, fine. I'll, let's take us to court. You say that I did these crimes, put me on trial. Let's go. So he volunteered and went on trial. And they went to um, Primus, who is the leader of Acheron, yeah. which is the um, pure law plane of existence. Yes. So when Primus sat there and listened to this, um, this trial, Asmodeus said, hey, look, first of all, we didn't do anything wrong. It is mortal ambition that gets them in hot water. We don't lie to them. They know exactly what they're getting into. Additionally, on top of that, we make it very clear within the bounds of law what they're going to be up to, and we bring them on board. And then we protect the rest of you assholes from the demons. So we're actually the greater good here. The angels flipped. They went absolutely batshit and went one after another saying, he did this crime, he did this crime, he did this crime. And every time, Asmodeus said, well, but wait a minute. Did I? Is it actually a crime to just ask that guy? Look, do you want to jump? You're up here on the top of the building. Do you want to jump? If you do, do a barrel roll. I'm not telling him to do it, right? And that's his whole argument on this. And so Primus, what got even the god, the, the fucking embodiment of law and order, uh, has a limit to his patience. <laughs> and was like, listen, angels, fucking stop. I, you, there's still a line up at the door. And uh, I've only got another eternity, so let's get to another 400 or so, and then we're going to move on. Zeriel lost her shit and went, no, 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 and so, like, stomped forward through everybody and, um, like, started freaking out. This whole thing is bullshit and, like, losing her shit. The other angels like, stop it. There's this huge angel fight in the middle of the court, of Primus's court. <laughs> Freaking Asmodeus is sitting there with a big-ass smile on his face going, thank you, bitches. <laughs> and Primus is like, all right, fine, everybody stop. Angels, you're wrong. Get the fuck out. Asmodeus, you're not guilty. You've done everything right, and it's fine. But I know you're up to shit. So you can go back. You can rule the nine hells. This can be all yours, but you have to keep with you this ruby rod. And it's called the ruby rod of Asmodeus. And it means that nothing up until this point is considered unlawful. But moving forward, if you or any devil breaks a contract, there will be hell to pay. I will rain judgment down upon you. And so that is why there are all of these contracts and why everybody technically follows the contracts. Even if they get outsmarted by mortals, they've got to let it go. Mm -hmm. Right? Because if they turn around and they break a contract, this shit is going to rain down upon them. I'm disappointed in you. Why? You mentioned Ruby Rod three times and didn't have a, a Fifth Element reference. No, I know that. Okay. These special episodes don't have a commercial! So. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. So, anyway, Asmodeus wants to rule, giving every creature in existence a place within the rigid infernal hierarchy. And he calls this his utopia. And only he is powerful and smart and wise and cunning and perfect enough to be able to rule everyone. He keeps getting more and more and more power. He walked into Mount Celestia, like, not that long ago in D&D lore. He just walked the fuck in to the final level of it, looked around at the gods and said, hey, fucking help us, and turned around and walked out. And everyone's like, what just happened? Holy shit, was that everything that was? <laughs> right? Like, he commands so much respect from literally everybody. He kicked up shit in Mount Celestia and walked the fuck out. Yeah. Because every soul that is collected by any devil and any archdevil is also technically collected and reaped because of Asmodeus, he also gets claim to that. So he doesn't have to dick around with any of this contract nonsense. He worries about the hierarchy of his archdevils. He worries about anybody that breaks contracts. And other than that, he spends his time fucking with demigods because he's got nothing better to do. And he's trying to take over the cosmos essentially yeah. so he's got bigger plans and he is not worried about your upstart fucking heroic group of level six warrior that does not give a shit however for the most part he lives in solitude because he doesn't give a shit nobody knows exactly where he is on the ninth level of hell except for the majority of his loyal followers but not even all of them know he relies on messengers and, and followers to be able to um, pass on his word and and give his decree to others and, like, report back to him. But he's got spies everywhere as well, as well as ways to contact these spies. So he is largely alone, especially since his 
fucking wife died. Yeah. Um, the only thing it says about the cults of Asmodeus is there is none. There's not one. Because every cult of every archdevil is technically a cult of Asmodeus. If you acknowledge the existence of one of them, you acknowledge his power over them. Therefore, if you offer your soul up, he gets a percentage. Cool. So he just doesn't give a shit. But everyone, literally everyone who follows any single one of these cults could get the demands of Nessus. Nessus being the, the ninth right. level. Yeah. Right? At the start of every turn, every turn, a creature with this power can choose one ally within 30 feet and siphon up to 10 hit points off of them. Oh. If the cultist is incapacitated, the ability just siphons off the nearest ally within 30 feet. You don't choose, it just hits the closest one. You can never die. The, that is the <laughs> Unless idea. Unless there's no allies around you. Yeah, you have to be alone. Un, un, until... 30 feet. Yeah, yeah, until you are dead. Until you are dead, yeah. dead. Yeah. So, this is super powerful. I will not hand this out. I will hand this out to my big bad evil guy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to hand this out to any player, any warlock. Any warlock that's a fiend patron already praised Asmodeus. So, yeah. I mean, chain... Blade, Tome, Talos, but doesn't matter. They all pray to him anyway. Yeah. Right? So, mm-hmm. um, so this guy's just like the most super powerful, badass, awesome guy. So powerful that I won't use him in a campaign. Fair enough. It's yeah. cheating. Because, honestly, if you guys can kill him, then I'm not doing it right. <laughs> and if I kill you, what are we doing here? Yeah. yeah. So, what is the fucking point? It is best to have him as being just a vague threat, like the General of Gehenna. Or, um, you know, Gaia, the Earth Mother Spirit. Yeah. Right? Just having these general threats out there so that people can be vaguely aware of the fact that the Abyss spawns demons. No one is going to slay the Abyss. It just is. I, I treat Asmodeus the same way. Yeah. Cool. Well, let's talk about the last one on our little chart here, and this is Mephistopheles. Now, not to be confused with Mr. Mephistopheles, who is a character from the Cats musical. And... Has a very tight butthole from what I've seen. From what you've seen. You haven't watched the butthole cut? <laughs> no, and I refuse to. Anyways. I'll send it to you, Dan. No, I'm okay. I'll never watch it. The My question to you guys is, how does a bard get their magic? Um, by fucking a dragon, right? No, the... no. Kyle, how does a bard get his magic? I always just kind of figure that he shreds so hard that... <laughs> <laughs> okay, you guys are fucking... Like, he just... Like, like, like the raw power of poetry. Like, it's... Yeah. it's, it's, I mean, it's well, you're, it's you're, you're, slam you're, poetry, right? Yeah. You're, we're talking you're like part Beethoven. Right. It, we still talk about him 400 years later, right? Yeah. Like, you're, you're all part right. It is pulling the language of the weave out to get words to power, right? Uh, or power to words is what how Bard gets the magic. A sorcerer gets their magic by... Power balance, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> by, by having their dad fuck a dragon. Or their grandparents somewhere down the line. But they've got that magical essence within them. Uh, how does a warlock get their magic? We've been talking about them this entire time. Um, by making a pact with... By making they go powerful. into the back room at Hot Topic. By making yeah. a pact with, with some greater uh, creature that could bestow this boon on them. A wizard gets its magic from reading. Yeah. And there is no creature in existence that loves reading more than Mephistopheles. Mephistopheles is a long fucking intro to get there, the <laughs> foremost wizard and master of the arcane in the nine hells. His land of Kenya is a bitterly cold, frozen landscape capable of freezing a creature solid in a matter of seconds. Mephistopheles' home is a large tower, because wizard, in the center of Kenya. The realm is desolate by design, though, as Mephistopheles, like other wizards, is enamored with arcane lore and experimentation. All around Kenya, his ice devils and arcane minions practice magical experiments far from the potential of disrupting or destroying other magical experiments and lore. There's like a whole bunch of like Antarctica outposts far away from each other. So when that one blows up, that one doesn't too. Pretty much exactly that. Because strewn around are hundreds if not thousands of secret citadels and libraries with scores of the highly intelligent souls he gathers re- researching even the most trivial arcane conundrum. Like Mordenkainen has come to Kenya multiple times because the level of nerd that Mephistopheles is... Morden kind of has to go, well, someone has to know it. If someone's going to know it in the universe, it's going to be Mephistopheles, right? He is so interested in gaining arcane power over absolutely, every, over absolutely everything. He has tomes and artifacts and stuff that nobody has seen in 
hundreds of thousands of years. Things are buried in the ice in Cania that could topple planes of existence. Would you say that this realm could be called crystal meth? <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> Do you think that Morton Kynan has a meth addiction? So, Not li- once. like in the real world, the lore of Mephistopheles is surrounded with mortals making deals for magical supremacy and power, and Mephistopheles more fix, man. <laughs> is more than willing to provide it should you not distract or disrupt his interests. He is a dark, brooding, moody lord of hell with a rash temper and vast cosmic power at his command. His works are what primarily protect Asmodeus and his realm of Nessus from any incursion, be it demonic, angelic, or mortal. Because of his focus into the arcane, Mephistopheles attracts those who want arcane knowledge and to use that power for dominion over others. He attracts the spellcaster NPCs to his thrall, his cults being usually made up of archmages, which makes sense, cult fanatics, cultists, mages, and priests. His signature spells are, and this is hilarious, Firebolt, Burning Hands, Flaming Spear, and Fireball. No, no, I love that. That makes perfect sense. Yeah, it's pretty good for a guy who lives in a realm that would make Icewind Dale feel like a heat wave in the tropics. No, no, it's, it's, it's not even that. Well, if I can't have this knowledge, no one can! I, I, I think he would be incredibly... Rem- like, there's, there's lore of him, like... If he thinks that you might annoy him, he will disintegrate you. Like, oh, yeah. It's, it's like, you have the potential to annoy me. Death. <laughs> like, Adam, there would be no one left in the world. It would just be, you have the potential to annoy me. Dead. Right? Um, there are imps and whatnot that refuse to go s- deliver messages from other arch devils and arch, arch fiends to Mephistopheles because... He'll kill the messenger? He'll kill the messenger. Mm. Right? If, if, the, if the message is worded even slightly you wrong. forgot the Oxford comma! Yeah, yeah no, it's it's going to be stuff like that, right? Uh, he with is every, also a... every librarian wants to be... He, he is yeah. he is the cosmos's librarian. You must be quiet around him. You must be, you know, devoted to the task that he sets to you. And should you have any impropriety whatsoever, you are dust on the floor. Like, the guy's insane. Anyways, any spellcasting creature with a desire for more magic and a less than confident grip on their soul will find a warm place to call home in the heart of this frigid fire lord. Any cultist that claims his boon can gain a spell shield, which grants advantage on all saving throws versus spells. And, if you succeed, you are granted temporary hit points equal to the spell level of the spell you save. Fuck that, I'm never handing that out to a player. Yeah, there's no limit to the amount you can do that. Yeah, yeah I'm no, never handing okay? that out. Now, should you be addicted to meth, which is why I hate you. Oh, did I steal it from yes. the Yes. Should you be addicted to meth and lead one of his many soul-driven research firms, you can gain Soul Leech, which has a bonus action whenever you want. Choose an ally within 30 feet of you and steal its lowest level spell slot. There's no save. Yeah. <laughs> Just be like, hey, Warlock, mine now. No, no, but it's lowest level, so you steal all of the level 1s and then you get the level 2s. You just stay there long enough, you can just siphon off all of the spell slots from a high-level cast. Well, this is really useful for a party that has that one player who's playing like a wizard or a cleric or something, who is just, something else always comes up on game night and he can't make it. So he's just a battery for the Mephistopheles cultist. (laughs) I like this, that's going to help warlocks, man. Oh, yeah. Who need the spell slots. This guy is packed at the tome, obviously. Yeah. And I'll accept packed at the chain, just your familiar is a level 20 wizard <laughs> you're, you're <familiar>. my spells <laughs> my you're familiar as a book <laughs> i was gonna say like an ant that you just disintegrate every time you're pissed off yeah <laughs> well, well i could see pack to the talisman as well because you get a magic item right like yes yeah. but there's no way this guy's packed to the chain there's no way this guy's packed to the blade no no so, do you know why no one else takes over this, like, magical library? I do, but for the sake of the podcast, go ahead. So, do you know his name? Hivistus? Or something like that? No. No. H- 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 it starts with an H. <laughs> Hudijin. Yeah, that's it. Hudijin looks like a pit fiend with a nasty mace, and he is one of the rare instances of pure loyalty in the Nine Hells. He's in command of two companies of pit fiends, which act as the aristocracy for Cania. And he's unwaveringly loyal to Mephistopheles. Maybe suspiciously loyal. It's hinted at that Mephistopheles has some control over Hudogen, who is a beast of a CR-21. Oh, this theory holds weight because Hudogen doesn't have a proper cult or any followers. Hmm. In fact, 
he apparently hates mortals so much that he sends devils into the material plane to wipe out any mention of himself. He rarely leaves, though, because Mephistopheles doesn't want it doesn't want to be left unguarded. If you do somehow manage to find his name and summon him, it's likely that Hooterjin will just fucking kill you. Hard stop, the end, you dead. He wants nothing to do with mortals. But people think that Mephistopheles, that might just be propaganda, mm-hmm. because Mephistopheles might just have complete control over this creature. Cool. Okay, guys, so now that we've covered these guys, with any good patron, we have the double cross with the warlock. With of your course, character. yeah. So at what point, this is the question I kind of want to wrap up the episode with, uh, now that we've established what these arch fiends are capable of doing, at what point do you pull the double cross? Yeah, wait, I'm well, confused. Why? Uh, uh, do you mean the warlock is double crossing the devil, or the devil is no, double crossing the, the warlock? Oh, the devil is double crossing the warlock. Oh, okay. Like, why, at what point do you pull the rug out from under your warlock? Sure. I got an 11. God damn it. So, <laughs> Kyle, with your natural 20. Um, Jesus. Uh, oh, the dice want to hear your opinion. Yeah. Uh, when do I pull the double cross on my warlock? I mean, uh, he has to get something that's important for my arch devil, right? Or his arch devil. Something that is like almost the, the no going back. Like he needs to hit the almost no going back area of committing to this, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Do you take away all of the power from the warlock when you do the double cross? In previous editions, if your god forsake your paladin, your paladin depowers. Yeah. Um, so what I would do is I would use this opportunity. Okay, so this is a sticky issue because I don't want to remove the power from your character for a long term. I think there will come a point where if your character completes the contract and the devil goes, okay, thank you. You've done your part. I will see you later. Um, you don't need your powers anymore or whatever that is, or the double cross happens and then the powers are gone. Give your player a little bit of time to determine what class they want to play next and then let them make that character that next class at the appropriate level of the party. I'm going to say no. See, okay. I do because I don't like it makes sense if it's the like a cleric sort of relationship, right? Where you have to constantly appease, you have to live your life by certain ideals. With a warlock, you, yeah, but it's if you not quite the same. No, but if right? you break the contract, yeah, aren't they just going to take the power back? Well, well yeah. you're talking about a double cross from the the patron, right? Yeah. So you, the warlock never went against it. He never broke a contract. Also, a devil can't break the contract. They can. They just. I mean, and that's well. Why, no, the the contract would be part of the. Uh, sorry, the double cross would be part of the contract. It's just something that the uh, uh, the fine warlock didn't kind of read, thing. right? Like part of the thing is you ever interact with this deity or you start siding in this way, I will pull the powers from you, yeah. right? Um. Look, honestly, I would never do it. First of all, I'm never going to do the double cross. Um. I'm just going to say, hey, you know what? You've reached level 14. We're going up to level 14 in this adventure module. You reached level 14. Uh, you've done everything I've needed you to, so I'm pulling the plug. Thank you very much. Your powers will disappear slowly over the next year until you have nothing left but one first level spell slot. You still know all of the spells, you just can't cast them over the next year. That lets your player finish off the campaign. It lets them see it through, but it doesn't... And, and from a canonical standpoint, that has disappeared over time, right? The same way that if you give up the faith of a church, you would lose the power and the benefits. It, it also depends on what the contract is and uh, what the request from the devil Look, is to begin my with. My comment right? for most DMs is don't do that. No, I mean, if you are going to be entertaining the idea of taking powers away from your player, have a ironclad reason and an ironclad uh, fallout plan. I got a question. Do you write your contract? Do oh, you no. actually write it up and put it in the hands of your player? I, I, I would love to. What I would do is I would uh, send an email to a friend of mine who I know would revel in the ability to write contracts to screw over players. And I would be like, Adam, if you could include these clauses in here, um, I just can't fill up the legalese. I, I know. In yeah, like, I'd, I'd spew some shit. In, sure. in four days, I'd get an email of just like. Here's a 30 
30 page treaties of yeah 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 Look, get I, your player to sign it in blood yeah. not the character your player <laughs> must sign it in blood yeah does it make it long enough that you know they'll never read it like a 200 page thing yeah are you these chamber? are players man it's a paragraph and a half in the team <laughs> she did, like have you seen player notes uh, yeah Can you I imagine? Have them. <laughs> <laughs> anyways so I absolutely would never do that I don't recommend that anybody else does it I think that's adversarial DMing. Mm -hmm. I'm only going to do that once you have finished. You finished the campaign. You have heisted the dragon or matted the mage. Whatever it is, you're done. You are now on your way home. Everyone gets an epilogue. The epilogue is you depower. See, I... That's it, right? And if you want to bring this character back for another thing, make a new contract. Make a new deal, and you can get back. Or you're a level whatever, so... Flip that over to be a... Uh... Well, one of the things that I like is if you're playing the traditional path of the Warlock where you make the pact with the devil, you have that redemption arc, you finish whatever it is, and then you're in the good graces with some divine being of whatnot, celestial warlocks are a thing, right? And just choose a different patron, make a new pact, right? Yeah. And and don't go through the process of you're now a level one. No, I mean, you ended at level 14. You're going to roll this guy up level 14 just with this different patron, mm -hmm. right? Um, or frankly, look, I, I used to be in the cult of Gurion. I'm going Levistus now because fuck that guy. He yeah. took my powers away, right? There's enough backstabbing and sides being taken. And exactly. Lines in the sand and shit like that when it comes to the Archdevils. You can find a new one to play with. Yeah. Would an Archdevil allow that, though? Like, you go, you sign that contract to me, you either complete it or I... No, but we're saying you. once it's completed yeah. and it depowers. But, I mean, then again, you go to, uh, was it Glacia, who's just going to find the double speak in it? Yeah. yeah. Right? Or you go to um, uh, Beelzebul and you get him to, like, all right, I need you to look through this for me. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. I will be yours if you do this for but, me. Like I said, have an ironclad in story reason why you're going to go through it, I would hazard against depowering without an alternative in line. Yeah. And I, if you're looking for all this weird legalese shit as well in D&D, &D, like in world, pick up Acquisitions Incorporated which oh, has yeah. like plaintiffs and shit yeah. in it as like backgrounds that you can have. And like, <laughs> there's all sorts of like legal, weird contractual shit in that book, which is a lot of fun. Yeah. Anyways, that'll be it for this deep dive into Archdevils. But there are lots of kind of warlock patrons, so stay tuned for more when you least expect it. And of course, have a safe and happy Halloween. If you'd like to support us, or just me, we have a donate button on our website, www.itsamimic.com, as well as a store where you can actually buy this G-string that I'm wearing right now. Please, please we don't. also rely on word of mouth to get the news to, of the podcast out there to the community so you can infect your friends with these visual images. Please pass the word to everyone you know that we're available on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube, as well as most of the podcast apps. Thanks again for listening to It's a Mimic, where you never know what you're going to get, and you might get grossed out. Yeah, mostly dick jokes. <laughs> <laughs>
I'm gonna you're, roll it in the box. Can you, God, can you get you your so book cool. away from the box? I'm sorry it was helping you not roll out of the box. Two, personality trait. Nobody is as smart as me, and I need to prove that all the time. So, so far, we're making Megan. All right. <laughs> all right. Now I'm, uh, ideals. Five, cunning. Those who can see an advantage in the direst situation deserve respect. Okay, cool. Um, Kyle, let's roll for a bond. D6. Okay. We got a five. If I do my duty in time, I will be rewarded. We just made the most devilish devil of all time. Yeah, pretty much. Um, I'm going to roll a d6 for the flaws. Good luck. Megan has no flaws. A three. I put in the minimum effort possible into anything including research. That wasn't my own idea. (laughs) No, okay. So it actually is fucking Dan that we're making on this. (laughs) Hey, fruit. Yeah, well, here we are, Dan. (laughs) Um, Adam, let's roll a d6 for these cult goals. Yeah, you gotta flip over to the end of the, the Blood War chapter now. Because this was in Mordenkind, it's at the end of the Devil section. This, now with the Fiendish Cults, is right before chapter 2. It's on page 34. Uh, what am I rolling? What is a d6 for goals? A uh, 3. Control of a guild or similar institution like a podcast. God damn. Alright, um, Kyle, roll a d6 for resources. Uh, two, we got the cult thrives through the support of generations of a powerful noble family. Okay, Dan, give us a organization. Organization, that is a D6, which is also a two. It is a false front. The cult puts on an elaborate deception to appear as a harmless civic group. And then finally, a cult you know, hardship. <laughs> <laughs> uh, cult hardship for a three. The cult struggles to rein in its dark, violent impulses. In order to remain undetected. Also USF. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> and Megan. And Megan. <laughs> okay, so as a recap here, we have Megan the Clever, who is uh, who believes that nobody is as smart as her, and she needs to prove that at all times. She is cunning. Those who can see an advantage in the direst situation deserve respect. Um, she's got a bond of, if I do my duty in time, I will be rewarded. And a flaw of, I put the minimum effort possible into anything that isn't my own idea. For her cult, they seek the control of a guild or a podcast or a similar institution. They thrive through the support of generations of a powerful noble family. Organized as a false front, where they put up an elaborate deception to appear as a harmless civic group. And they struggle to rein in its dark, violent impulses in order to remain undetected. What's her cult called? What's Megan's cult called? Yeah. I would say that, it, like, it, it's not Masonic, it's Megonic. Like, wh- where are we going? Should it be cult of the bl- blondest hair and reddest fist? Like, uh, human fighters are us. Uh, the cult of Oh My Lanta. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. And their, their uh, catchphrase is, Oh My Sweet Summer Child. Jesus. Every fucking episode. <laughs> I am not kidding. <laughs> oh, and also, uh, they like to scoot over there. Every time we're playing D&D, Megan's character doesn't walk across the room or she sprint. scoots. She scoots. She's always just scooting. She's like a dog with worms. <laughs> you heard it here first. Dan said Megan is a dog with worms. <clears throat> no, I'm just speaking Klingon. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Happy Halloween. At It's a Mimic, this is our favorite holiday, and we love to... What? Nothing, man. I just I just laugh at you because you don't sound excited. Like, Hello, everyone. You're just... You're in announcer mode, and announcer mode isn't a happy mode. Do you need Kyle to tickle your taint? No. Uh, come on. I, I got really, really magic fingers. I would really rather it didn't happen <laughs> this time. You're missing out. Thanks for listening. Bye.